Well, there we go. I think maybe we can start at seven o'clock. We don't want to keep you all waiting. You're chomping at the bit to get going. Hopefully everybody's been able to do a little reading and uh, got ahead on the reading so that we're familiar with what's, uh, uh, what we're going to be tackling this evening. And uh, I'm looking forward to this evening. And uh, um, but again, like uh, you know, like the other times, let's begin with uh, a little bit of uh, a worship song, a little worship time, and uh, Sister Jean Paul Marie is with us to bring us into the presence of the Lord. Lord Jesus, we bring ourselves into your presence. You who is here among us, you are the God who saves us. So Lord Jesus, we just invite you right now into the depths of our heart. We quiet our hearts. We make a room there for you, Lord. We lift up to you this day this gift that you have given us that we have spent either profitably or semi-profitably or maybe it might be a complete waste of a day lord but we lift it up to you right now and we lift up to you our hearts that they might rise like incense before your throne and we raised you this gift that you gave to us at the beginning of the day in whatever state it's in right now we just give it back to you with all the love in our hearts. And we direct all of our affections, all of our distractions, all of the things that have taken our heart this day, and we direct them back on you, Lord. For you are worthy of all praise. Come, Holy Spirit, fill our hearts. Enkindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created, and you will renew the face of the earth. Come, Holy Spirit. Sweet. 
turn to you. Yes, Lord Jesus, open up the heavens, Lord, and shower your light, your love, your grace upon us, Jesus. Come have your way with each one of us, Jesus. We give you permission to come and work in us tonight, Lord Jesus, to dwell within us, your children, your sons and daughters. Or lift up our hearts tonight. Help us to see you, to see your glory, to see your presence as you work in our lives, each one of us, Jesus. Open up our minds, Jesus, to understand these great mysteries of the faith. Lord God, put a new courage, a new zeal in our hearts, especially in the, the challenges we face in our time, Jesus. Come, Lord, speak to us through this book. Speak through us through this letter, this Acts of the Apostles letter, Lord Jesus. Ignite something new within our heart, Lord Jesus. Something new, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord, set your people free as well, Lord. Free to worship you, free to follow you, free to serve you, Jesus. Lord God, purify our hearts, refine our hearts, Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus, we want to serve you, Jesus. We want to love you, we want to follow you. Make it possible for each one of us, Jesus. You are mighty, mighty and powerful, Jesus. We give our lives to you tonight, Jesus. 
We give our future to you tonight, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And so I bless all of you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome back. Great to have you all with. And I'm here with Brian Sullivan. Brian has been uh, uh, teaming. I've been teaming up, obviously, with Brian for the last uh, few weeks. We're already in week number three. We only after tonight, we got two more to go. So you're doing well. We're over the halfway point there in the Acts of the Apostles. I think there's 28 chapters, as far as I know. We've got to We've read up to 15, so there we go. We're past the midway point, uh, so that's great. And we're looking forward to, to uh, diving and digging in tonight. Uh, Brian's going to take us through a whole bunch of the kind of the history, hi, you know, kind of uh, the, not line by line, but kind of event by event. He's going to do the more chronological survey and uh, throw in his own kind of insights. And then I'm going to tag along and and uh, and open up some of the ideas that have really touched me in this book so so welcome back and uh, i'll turn it over to to brian then thanks father that's great let's get uh, start right off we're covering tonight acts 9 32 to 15 35. we may not get to chapter 15 we'll see about that see how quickly we can we can go but well, i wanted to start by saying in acts there are four phases to spreading the word from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth, right? It's all about spreading the kerygma through the power of the Holy Spirit. The first phase is with the 12 apostles and those in Jerusalem. The second phase then happened after the martyrdom of St. Stephen, when the persecution started to happen, particularly to the Hellenists, the Greek Jews, and they kind of spread out and they went into the uh, Judean and the Sumerian countryside. The third phase then is what we're going to cover today. And it occurs when Peter travels through Judea, visiting the various communities that have been established to strengthen them. And in the process, the Lord opens his mind and his heart to, heart to the Gentiles. The fourth phase of Acts involves uh, Paul's three missionary journeys to bring the gospel to the territories of the Gentiles. So we're going to cover the first of his missionary journeys tonight. Uh, the chapters tonight that we're going to cover fall also into four sections. So I'm going to tell the story in four parts. And after each section, then Father and I will, will maybe make a reflection or two, and then we'll, we'll introduce the next section. So the first section deals with, with um, chapter 9, verse 32, to chapter 11, verse 18. It really focuses on Peter and his travels and his encounters as he goes about Judea. So he, the first thing that happens is he visits a, a Judean town called Lydia and he cures a paralytic. He's been, this paralytic's been bedridden for eight years and it says the town was converted. He moves on to the next town, Jaffa. It's on the Mediterranean coast. And he raises Dorcas to life or Tabitha to life. And many more come to believe in Jesus. Chapter 10, 10 begins, he's still in Jaffa, but the story focuses on Cornelius. And Cornelius is a centurion who's stationed in Caesarea within Judea. It's also on the coast of the Mediterranean. Now, this, um, this Roman believes in God and is very generous with the Jewish people. I'm just going to, we're, we're going to follow, uh, oops, let me just change that here. Uh, we don't need that just yet, sister. We can, we can, we don't have to screen share that just yet. I'll be, I'll be sharing that. I'll let you know when we need to screen share that. Um, so the story of Cornelius. So he's a believer in God. He's praying to God one day and an angel appears to him and directs him to invite Peter and gives him very definite instructions about how to get to Peter in Jaffa, how, how to invite Peter, how to find Peter. So he sends three of his men out to find Peter and bring him back to him. Uh, Jaffa and um, Caesarea are about a day's travel apart. So the next day, Peter's having a vision as he prays, and he sees this sheet being let down from heaven, and on it, or in it, contained in it, is every animal and bird on, on the earth. 
the clean and the unclean. And what God says to him is, Peter, take and eat. And Peter says, Lord, nothing, nothing unclean is, or profane has ever entered my lips. And the Lord says to him, Peter, what I have made clean, you have no right to call unclean. And, he, and this vision, Peter, repeats itself three times, just to emphasize the importance it is uh, for Peter. I just want to make um, a, a kind of a clarification about why they use the word clean and profane. Um, and unclean. Un unclean is an animal like pork. You know the Jews cannot eat pork. It's considered an unclean animal. But a, an animal that is profane has touched an unclean animal. Was a clean animal, touched something unclean, it becomes profane. So in this sheet, you have all these animals gathered together, and those that were clean have become un unclean or profane because they have touched the unclean animals. But the Lord is saying to Peter, these are all clean. Just as the vision is finishing for the third time, there's a knock at the door. The people at the door, the three men that Cornelius has sent. And so before, before Peter goes to answer, the Lord says to Peter, don't doubt. So Peter goes, answers the door. He knows they've traveled from Caesarea, so he invites them in to stay the night, which is unheard of for a, for a Jew to invite a Gentile into his house for the night, right? Doesn't use him, but he's beginning to understand this message. The next day they leave uh, for Caesarea. The, the following day uh, they meet Cornelius. He prostrates himself before Peter. Peter says, I'm a man like you, stand up. And then Peter begins to address them and, and speak about the kerygma and, and speak about the forgiveness that Jesus came to die for our sins. And as he's doing this, before he's even finished, the Holy Spirit falls upon the Gentiles that are gathered there because Cornelius has invited his friends, close friends and his family to hear Peter. Well, they break out in tongues and Peter recognizes that the Holy Spirit has been given to them and he baptizes them. He understands now that even the pagans can receive the Holy Spirit. Chapter 10 ends there, but chapter 11 then, Peter goes back then to Jerusalem and is challenged by those in Jerusalem saying, you visited Gentiles, you ate with, with the uncircumcised. So he explains the story of Cornelius. They get it. They give glory to God for granting the pagans repentance that leads to new life, to everlasting, eternal life. Father wanted me to stop here because he wants to explain something about the development of the understanding of the covenant that God made with the, the Israelite people. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, I was it just, uh, uh, just even as I'm thinking now, I remember um, he had been touring us around uh, Jerusalem and um, the whole story of Cornelius somehow came up there. We were discussing it or maybe we were at a location there where it was, it was, uh, you know, brought to mind. And the, this guide was saying, yeah, this whole event with Cornelius was a turning point really in the Christian uh, church or, or people because had the whole event not happened really, essentially Christianity would have remained a sect of Judaism. In a sense, we would be kind of a, a right within Judaism. But really, this um, doing away with some of the ritual purity laws, the circumcision and all of these kind of uh, uh, mosaic ceremonial laws really made a huge shift and opened up the, the, the proclamation of Jesus really to the whole world. It was no longer going to be just uh, for the Israel people, Israelite people, no longer just for the nation of Israel. Now it was really moving, you might say as well, into what Scott Hahn has termed a universal covenant. Up until now, we might have looked at the covenant as being one of a kind of a national covenant where the Lord is working with the nation of Israel. He's made a covenant. And just to go back, like what is a covenant? We hear the word covenant tossed all about. And in fact, Scott Hahn, if you want to do some good reading here, he's got a great little book, A Father Who Keeps His Promises. And really he goes through, he wrote that quite a while ago, I think in 1989, but it's really a survey of covenant theology 
in the uh, in the scriptures and really he says covenants are oftentimes almost associated with contracts when we make a contract with someone but what's different about a covenant is a covenant isn't just an exchange of property it's really an exchange of persons you know and marriage would be the closest thing that looks you know that that images a covenant when a husband and wife or a man and woman they say i give myself completely to you until death do us part that's an exchange of persons i'm giving myself to the other and at the heart of a covenant is this total gift to the other and really the covenants with god it's it's God giving himself to us and he's inviting us to give ourselves to God. He wants, you know, that kind of marriage relationship with each one of us. And that's the beauty of the covenants. And in fact, we see just Scott Hahn in his book, he, he proposes that there, you know, were like half a dozen covenants. Maybe sister can put up that little, uh, little uh, um, PowerPoint. And uh, he shows how really you know, there was a, an initial covenant with Adam, and it was kind of a marriage covenant, if you look down at the third row there. And then the, the covenant he makes with Noah, well, this becomes a household covenant. And then with Abraham, now there's a tribal covenant. You know, and, and, and then with Moses, it becomes a national covenant. So it's like as history is going along, the covenant the, the, the covenant is, you might say, expanding. The, the, the recipient of the covenant, now God is expanding his household from, you know, just a couple now to a household, to a tribe, to a nation. And then with David, it becomes a kingdom, right? The, the, the Israelite people, the kingdom of Israel. And so, you know, there's this series of covenants that got bigger, bigger, bigger. Well, now all of a sudden in Acts, it seems to me, chapter 11 here, 12, we're seeing this shift now to the next covenant. It was instituted in Jesus when Jesus died on the cross, you know, in his blood, we have a new covenant, you know, in the, in the, the exercise, in the, in the, you know, enactment or, or the, the initiation of the Eucharist. But really now the covenant is going to go beyond the borders of Israel. It's becoming a, a universal covenant. And, and, and so what we can say is now the grace of salvation is not just there for the Israelite people. It's for everyone. You know, all those who would come to Jesus in faith, all those who would come to him with a, a humble heart, right? All those who would give, be ready to give their life over to God can begin to enter, can now enter into the covenant. So this is huge. This is a huge turning point in the history of Christianity. It's a huge turning point in terms of the, the expanding of the covenant. And what a great blessing that is that you and I now, you know, can participate fully in the life of God. And that God has made, you know, obviously at the heart of covenant is promises that are made. And God has made promises to be our God. He says, I'm going to be your God. I'm going to look after you. I'm going to care for you. I'm going to be faithful to you. You know, God has made all sorts of covenant promises, just like husbands and wives make promises to one another to care for each other in sickness and in good times and bad. Well, God makes all these promises to us. He says, yeah, I want to be your God. I want to look after you. I want to provide for you. I want to guide your life. I want to, and not only that, I'm going to come and help you with your sin. I'm going to come and make it possible for you to be forgiven. You know, and he, he ends up going to the cross. He sends his own son to come and die for us so that our sins can be forgiven and we can come to spend eternity with the Father in heaven. So the covenants are powerful. I think the more we get a handle on the covenants, the more we realize the faithfulness of God, you know, and we can begin to call God on the promises. I love the promises because every now and again, I call the Lord on it. Lord, you made a promise to me. You made a promise that you would be my God. Lord, you made a promise that you would, you know, provide for me, that you would hear my prayer, that you would guide me, you know, all of my day. Well, Lord, I need you to be faithful to that promise. I need your help here. Come, Lord Jesus. And we can call God because he's made that vow and he doesn't break his vows. We may break our vows, but he says, you know, even though we be unfaithful, the Lord's not unfaithful. The Lord will always be faithful to us. So anyways, those are just a few thoughts on that. I guess one other thing, the whole Cornelius story, you know, really grabs me. Maybe, sorry, two other points. Number one, you know, it's beautiful that we see... Uh, you know, number one, that it's such a sovereign 
event that's happening. Like Peter gets this whole trance and vision. Cornelius gets this whole revelation. Both of them at the same time, Cornelius gets told to go over, send his servants over to find this guy who's Peter. He even knows who it is. And he like you just see the sovereignty in it all. And then Peter goes over there and then he starts talking to them and the Holy Spirit falls on them. You just see again. So for Peter to, in a sense, dismiss some of that mosaic ritual purity law, that was huge. But this was no just coincidence. This is like you just see with it was it was so, you know, can anyone, isn't that what St. Peter says, can anyone doubt? Can anyone doubt that this is the Lord? Can, can, can anyone raise an objection for us to baptize the Gentiles here? That's his question. What he's saying is like, God has made it so clear in this situation to me, to Cornelius, to those that he wrote, that this is what God wants. And so he had no doubts in his mind. And you see the exercise already of the Peter, of Peter, the first pope. You see Peter here already exercising. He's he's been chosen. He's the rock upon Jesus going to build the church. He's been chosen, set apart, and so the Lord uses him, you know, powerfully and all that. I'll touch on one more point. You know, I don't want to take all your time there, but you know, it's interesting that it was Cornelius and his family. You see that reference two or three times there. Not only Cornelius, but his family. And it said, you know, they were baptized. The assumption is that he had a whole family that was baptized. And I think what we always have considered is that there were probably children involved in that. You know, and as Catholics, we have the whole history and tradition of infant baptism, where we baptize infants, you know, at a very young age. And many of our Protestant brothers and sisters have a very hard time with that because it's like that child has not re 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 reached the age of reason. They've not been able to kind of appropriate faith for themselves. They've not been able to make an altar call. How can we baptize them? They don't have any personal faith. And the church has always said, well, you know, because we're a communion of believers, where there's a unity in the family, in the body of Christ, what happens is the community supplies the faith for the infant so that the infant can be baptized, right? And so it's a community supplying that grace until, which until the time that the infant can reach the age of reason or become an, uh, becomes an adolescence where they are invited and challenged to accept Jesus in their own, in, uh, as their own Lord and Savior in their life. Now, we don't do a very good job of challenging them to come into adult faith in our time, but this whole, I think this passage here as well, the story of Cornelius, Put, gives us a little insight into the, this whole, uh, or gives us some kind, kind of foundation for infant baptism as well, and the practice of infant baptism. And if you read various articles, apologetic articles, they'll turn to this passage on, from Cornelius as a kind of an argument for in favor of, of infant baptism. Uh, thank so you, Father. Yeah. Wonderful points. Great. So we're going to go to part two of our story, and this is from chapter 11 to 9, verse 19 to 1225. And we're seeing now the focus shift. We're in Jerusalem. It shifts back now to Gentile territory and what's happening in those established communities. Uh, then we have an abrupt shift back to Jerusalem and the situation that it, it's facing, a serious situation it's facing. So, so what happened... Um, after Peter's, after, sorry, after um, Stephen's martyrdom, right, you, you get, you get particularly the Hellenists, the Jews that, that are following the way, moving out into um, the countryside in Judea and Samaria. But you also now here, it says they go beyond the Jewish territories into Phoenicia, into the island of Cyprus, into Antioch. And there they begin to proclaim the message in the synagogues and eventually to the Greeks present, all right? And it says that many believed. So Barnabas was sent from Jerusalem, and he witnesses this. Now, remember that Barnabas is one of the, one of the deacons, one of the seven deacons. And, and, he goes and, he, and he goes to strengthen them, and he urges that they all remain faithful to the gifts the Lord has given them, right? But Barnabas decides he's going to find Paul, who he knows is in Tarsus, because he, he had to leave Jerusalem because they wanted to, to kill him. 
he goes and finds them in Tarsus, brings them back to Antioch, and they spend a whole year in, in Antioch. And they're, what they're doing is they're building up the Christian community. Then we have this story switches to this fellow named Agabus. And Agabus is coming from Jerusalem. And he's traveling with a group of prophets. And he goes, um, goes into Antioch. He, he, pro, he um, prophesies that there's going to be a famine and it's going to hit the empire. And so what the disciples do is they gather money, all that they could afford. They give it to Barnabas and Paul. Barnabas and Paul take it back to Jerusalem. And it says that the famine did happen during the reign of Claudius. And Claudius reigned from 41 to 45 AD. And that then switches the story then back to Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, some bad things are happening. King Herod Agrippa the first, Not the King Herod that was, was alive when Jesus was around, but King Herod Agrippa. He beheads the Apostle James. And I believe this is the first apostle that was martyred, James, the brother of John. right? The one that, that went in, in deeper into the Garden of Gethsemane. With, with John and Peter, the one that went to the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus and, and uh, John and Peter. This is the James that's, that, that Herod puts to death. And because the Jews, he, he, he senses that the Jews are excited about this, he then decides he's going to get Peter too. And so he, he, he arrests Peter, puts him in jail, securely in jail. He's, he's got his feet in irons. He's got two guards on either side of Peter. He's got a guard stationed at the first door and a guard's at the second door. Secure. But that night, this is the second time that an angel then frees Peter from jail. Peter thinks he's having a vision, doesn't even realize it's real because they're just walking by all the guards. And the, and the doors are opening themselves and, until he's on the street and the angel leaves him. So he, 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 once he collects himself, he goes to the house of John Mark's mother. We're going to hear John Mark some more. John Mark, it's, it's, it's thought that it's John Mark is the Mark that wrote the Gospel of Mark. We want to keep that in mind as we go through. We're going to hear his name a few times. But he goes to the faithful that are gathered at John Mark's house, and he just says to them, go and tell James and the others that I'm free. Now, this is James, not the one that is, has been martyred, but this is James, um, the cousin of Jesus. Who's, who we understand was the bishop of Jerusalem. And then he leaves and hides because he knows Herod is going to come looking for him. And he doesn't want to, to um, endanger all those people. Herod ne the next day goes and sends for him. He's gone. He, Herod has the guards executed. He's very angry. The other thing that Herod does, though, uh, people from Tyre and Sidon are coming and asking Herod for a favor. They really depend on... on um, Judah for their food. And, and Herod's mad at them. So they send a delegation to, to speak to Herod, Herod and ask for a favor. So Herod gets on his um, all his digs and he goes, stands on a dais and he, and he makes a big speech. And the people there from Tyre and Sidon start calling him a god and no man because they're flattering him because they want this favor. But what happens is that the Lord strikes him dead because he he didn't uh, he accepted the glory that people were giving him and then didn't didn't uh, say this is this is God not me. Mm. We have then Paul and Barnabas returning to to Antioch then and they bring with them John Mark. I'm going to call him John Mark so we don't get mixed up with the Apostle John. Okay. Um, Father Ben is going to talk about Barnabas and, his, um, and, and about why he searched out Paul to help him kind of stabilize the church in Antioch. Father? Yes, yeah, certainly. Yeah, I think uh, we see that right at the Acts, end of Acts chapter 11. You were talking about that, Brian. And, uh, you know, great things have been going on there in, in, uh, in uh, Antioch, right? And many, many had come to believe in the Lord and news spread to Jerusalem. So there was kind of an excitement. So they send Barnabas there and Barnabas realizes, hey, there's a lot of work here to do. We got to be, we, you know, many have come to the Lord. Well, now they need to be discipled. We got to be helping them grow in their faith. It's not just enough to evangelize someone, you know, without supporting them and helping them walk into maturity in their Christian life. 
right? And so they've they've got to they've got to invest in this community now. They've got to really press into this community. And so Bar and Barnabas, the other thing is, he didn't realize he can't. He's not going to be able to do this on his own. And so he goes, you know, to Tarsus or he calls, you know, Paul from Tarsus to come, you know, so Barnabas went to Tarsus or it says there he went there to look for Saul, right? And we found him. He brought him back to Antioch, right? Convinced him, hey, here's where you should be. I need some help. You know, and it's a good principle. You know, I don't think we should be working alone. It's not always good for us to be, you know, one man show kind of working in isolation, serving the kingdom. Throughout the scriptures, Jesus seems to be sending out the disciples, apostles, two by two. He often is really encouraging uh, teamwork, Jesus himself. And we see that already here in the Acts of the Apostles. They're, they're working together. They're a team. You know, now they're not always good. The teams are going to shift up at, at times, right? And and uh, later on, we're going to see some real conflict there in one of the relationships. But at this point, you know, Barnabas and Paul end up working there. They end up working all year, right? So uh, how does it say? For a whole year, they met with the church and they taught a large company of people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first for the first time called Christians, right? This is the first time they're called Christians, but they, they spent a whole year discipling them. Again, as well, we often think when we read the Acts of the Apostles, these guys, they're just going from place to place to place to place to place to place. They never settle down anywhere. Well, here right away we see Paul and Barnabas spending a whole year in Antioch working with these people. And the principle I draw from there is it's not enough just to evangelize someone. We have to disciple them. You know, the example I have is in my own life. My dad, my, 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 my earthly dad, he's here watching us tonight. Well, he's the one who really evangelized me in my early 20s. He really shared Jesus with me and challenged me to open my heart up to God. And, and I began to pray. I hadn't prayed for years. And I began to experience the Lord. And I en ended up, you know, within the course of six months or a year, I gave my life to Jesus. Well, you know, he, my dad did not abandon me at that point in my faith. Now he's my dad, so you can expect that he's going to, you know, continue the relationship. But I would also say my dad discipled me for many years. For many years, he would call me every week. Okay, son, how are you doing? Are you getting holy? How are you doing? Are you growing in your faith? My dad was always challenging me hey, to become the disciple, to become the follower of Jesus that the Lord wanted me to be. He wasn't just operating, I think, as a, as an earthly father. He was operating as a, a mentor, right, in my discipleship, you know. And so that's what these people were doing in Antioch. They were really discipling the people, helping them to grow in their maturity of faith, helping them to grow in, you know, round out their experience of, of walking in, in, in Christ. So we can go into a whole thing on what does discipleship mean. That's probably a whole lecture for another time. But but uh, we see a little little hint of it right here. So, uh, Thank you, Father. That's great. We're, we're going to, and Antioch becomes a, a, a real center for, for um for the church and for missionaries going out from from Antioch, right? We're going to see that later in Acts. So that's that's wonderful. Okay, we're going to go to the third part of this story now, where for the chapters we're covering, where Paul and Barnabas, right? They're they're going to set out for their first missionary journey, and it's talked about in chapters 13 and 14. So you remember that they're right now they're in Antioch. And they, they receive a prophetic word that they are to be set apart for mission. And after prayer and fasting, they set out. Okay, sister, if you would share that map now, that would be great. Okay. Okay, the map there shows the first of their uh, of their of their missionary journeys, and I just thought we should have up there for you so that you you've got some context. The, the names of the towns will mean something to you as I as I just take you quickly through their journey. So they leave Antioch in Syria. So there are two Antiochs, but they leave the Antioch in Syria and travel to Seleucia on the coast, and they take a ship to the island of Cyprus, landing at Salamis. Right now, Barnabas is a Cyprian. He's grown up there, 
So he's going to familiar territory, actually. And and it seems that, that they appro- their approach to evangelizing is seems to always be the same. They go to the Jewish community and they proclaim Jesus in the synagogues. We're going to see that pattern repeat again and again. It says that they travel through the whole island and they get to the other side of the a- island at Paphos. And the proconsul, remember this is this is controlled by the Romans, the proconsul that they're ask them to preach the word of God to him. And so Paul and Barnabas go to do that. But there's this man who is a Jew, Bar-Jesus is his name. He's a magician. He's also a false prophet. But he's one of the proconsul's attendants. And as Paul speaks, Bar-Jesus tries to stop him from converting the proconsul. Paul is Sergius. What ends up happening is that Paul calls them an utter fraud for twisting the straight ways of the Lord. Those are his words. And Bar-Jesus becomes struck blind right then, temporarily. But all of that happening and the proconsul seeing that sign from the Lord was converted. And he he was the highest uh, Roman official converted throughout this journey in Acts. This happens, they leave the island, then they travel north along the Mediterranean to Perga in Pamphylia. Now the map shows, you think Perga is is the furthest one to your left. It's actually to the right. Perga is is the town to the right. And it's in the Roman province of Pamphylia. So that's where they land. John Mark at this point, who has traveled with them as a kind of an assistant across Cyprus, They land here. John Mark, for some reason, leaves. No explanation as to why, but he leaves to go back to to Jerusalem. The others, though, travel on to Antioch in Pisidia, in that province of Pisidia. So, So Antioch, now we have an Antioch in Syria where they started from. Now there's Antioch in Pisidia. If you're reading, it can be confusing. Uh, The one in Syria is going to be their home base, but this one is in the Roman province of Pisidia. So, they go to the synagogue like they normally do. Paul is invited to speak. So, Paul speaks of the Jewish histories and the promise, just like Father explained to you about the covenant growing. This is kind of what Paul does with the Jews that are there. And he showed how the fulfillment was in Jesus. Well, it was so well received that he's asked to preach the following Sabbath on the same theme. And so they have the week that they spend there, and there are many devout Jews and converts that join them through that week. So Paul and Barnabas continue through the week to urge them to remain faithful to the grace that God has given them in their conversion. The next Sabbath, almost the whole town appears, it says. Well, the Jews that haven't accepted the message became jealous, and they started to contradict Paul. And this is where you hear Paul's famous response. Since you don't think yourself worthy of eternal life, we must turn to the pagans. It made the pagans really happy and they thank God. The word of God spread through the whole countryside there, the pagan countryside. But what happens to Paul and Barnabas then is they're expelled from Antioch. Undaunted though, they travel to the next town, Iconium. It's just east of Antioch there. And this begins chapter 14. In Iconium, then, they evangelize in the synagogue again, which is their pattern. Many of the Jews and Greeks, they say, believed. They stayed there preaching for some time. They worked signs and wonders. But the people in Iconium were divided. And the Jews that, that decided not to believe worked up the pagans to be against Paul. And they were going to stone Paul and Barnabas. But Paul and Barnabas catch wind of this, so they leave and they travel to the next town of Lystra in the province of Laconia. In Lystra, Paul heals a crippled man who he sees as he's preaching has the faith to be healed. That's an interesting statement, has the faith to be healed. And he is healed. He's been crippled from birth. Now, the people in seeing this think that they're Greek gods. Zeus and Hermes, and they want to offer sacrifice and they want to offer an oxen to them. And Paul and Barnabas stop them from doing that and try to point them to and help them understand that 
The God of the whole creation is who's doing this, not us. But what happens then is the Jews from Antioch and Iconium have followed Paul and Barnabas to Lystra. And they end up turning the people against them. And they end up stoning Paul and they drag his body outside the town, believing that he's dead. And all it says in this account in, in, in uh, chapter 14 is that his apostles gathered around him. He stands up. And he headed right back into town. Now, we don't know if he was raised from the dead or, or, or he just came, was knocked out and came back. It, it doesn't explain that, except that he goes right back into town. Now, the next day, Paul and Barnabas head to Derbe. It's, all it says about Derbe is they made many disciples. And then as they talk about things, they decide that what they have to do is retrace their steps now. Because they've established these these. Catholic, these communities, Christian communities, and they need to go back now to them and, and strengthen them. So they travel backwards. So you see the arrow going the other way. They go to Lystra, Iconium, Antioch, and they travel through the province of Pisidia and Pamphylia to Perga again, where they had landed. And then they go a little bit farther to Attilia, a little bit farther. It's on the Mediterranean coast there. You can see that. Now, as they retrace their steps, what they're doing is they're encouraging the disciples to persevere in the faith, warning them to expect hardships. That's part of the journey to the kingdom of God. But they also appoint elders. Some, um, some translations say proselytes, um, which can be translated into priests. So they appoint these priests to lead the churches in those areas. And after fasting and prayer, they commend them to the Lord. So we see that fasting and prayer happening again. Once they reach uh, Attilia, then they sail back to Antioch in Syria, where they share all that's been done in their first mission trip with those in Antioch, Syria and Antioch. So one of the things that, that as Father and I talked about this, that we, we, we thought we should mention was, was what we see in Paul and Barnabas' first journey is the particular way the Lord would have us respond to the truth he's revealing. See, on the island of, of Cyprus, we see Bar-Jesus trying to stop Paul from converting the proconsul. Paul calls him what? The utter fraud. And he actually... And he calls him the utter fraud for twisting the straight ways of the Lord. Because what he's doing is he's twisting the truth. And Paul actually calls him a son of the devil. And he does that because the devil is the father of lies. And here's Bar-Jesus twisting the truth. Right? And so Bar-Jesus temporarily struck blind in response. It's like his spiritual blindness leads to the physical blindness. The Lord is getting his attention. Right? But through, his, through this all happening, the pro-council gets converted. And it doesn't say whether Bar-Jesus is converted. Why? He's only temporarily blinded. Maybe like Saul himself, he had a change of heart. We don't know. But the other response we see when they get to Asia Minor, or um, Antioch and Iconium and, and Lystra, that's present-day Turkey, when, when they initially proclaim the, the kerygma, when the people initially receive the word, it's, it's received in great excitement by many, and consistently many are converted, right? And then we get this kind of rebound effect. The second response happens shortly after, and we're always, um, we're always seeing the result of, of disbelief that's often founded in jealousy hmm. or in some kind of um, disorder. Or weakness. So in Acts 13, 45, we read it, this happens in Antioch. When they saw the crowds, the Jews, prompted by jealousy, used blasphemies and contradicted everything Paul said. So we, have, we see the devil, the, you know, the, the, the jealousy causing them to twist the truth again. In Acts 14, 2, in Iconium, it says some of the Jews, however, refused to believe. And they poison the minds of the pagans against their brother. That's right. So they plan to stone them. And then we, in Lystra, after Paul cured the blind man, and they wanted to, and they called them gods and wanted to make sacrifice to them, 
that's immediately followed in Acts 14, 19 by, by what happens is then the Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and turned the people against the apostles. And they end up stoning Paul, leaving him for dead. So, so the devil follows up on the good work that the Lord has been doing to cause dissension, disunity, disruption, right? He used the weaknesses of people to sow these seeds. Jealousy in Antioch, the hardened hearts in Laconium, and the fickleness of the people in Lystra. And I would say the devil's tactic, tactics haven't changed in 2,000 years. Our spirits will recognize when truth is being spoken. Our nature tempts us to cling to what's comfortable, right? To our traditions, to our power, to our status, to those things we're attached to. Why is it harder for the rich man to enter heaven? Because he has more attachments. He has more status, more power, more comforts. Why is the church flourishing in so many third world countries now, while in the West it's in crisis? In the third world, they know they can't do it on their own and they're depending on God. We in the West have become self-reliant. Instead of relying on the Word of God, we're relying on ourselves and our own abilities. We've gotten comfortable. Just one more point about this. You know, the other way to, to, to look at the response is, what if you've got the, a charism that the Lord has, has given you and that, that He's really using powerfully? We heard how Cornelius prostrated himself in front of... Peter and Peter's immediate response is to stand him up and say, you know, I'm only a man like you. He doesn't accept the honor that's rightfully God's. And when Paul and Barnabas healed the cripple and the people of Leicester want, want to call them gods and want to sacrifice an oxen to them, they tear their clothes in extreme distress, right? And, and, he, and they stop them saying, man, why are you doing this? We are of the same nature as you. We're human beings. They don't want the Lord's work to be misconstrued. They want the people to know the truth. They want the people to give God glory, understanding that it's His power, not theirs. There's a humility and an honesty. But Herod Agrippa shows us the other side of the coin, right? When the people flatter him as a God and no man, because they want a favor from him, he accepts the glory. And it's struck down because it says, he did not ascribe the honor to the Lord. Herod's response was prideful, arrogant, blasphemous. And I guess it's a caution from Luke for us. When the Lord is using us powerfully, the devil will try to tempt us to take the glory in our pride and our arrogance. We've really got to be careful that we don't, don't allow that to happen. That we point always to the Lord, like Mary did. Or like... Paul and Barnabas and Peter did here. Father, you wanted to talk about here the, the hardships and, and the rejection that's talked about. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, that's awesome, Brian. I mean, I think how do we respond, right? It's it's nice to see the examples out there of different individuals through Acts of the Apostles that really responded in very concrete ways. I think ultimately the question is how do I respond to God? When the Holy Spirit is, you know, tugging at my heart, when the Holy Spirit is asking me to move this direction or that, am I ready to respond with an open heart? Or do I harden my heart, right? Do I resist the Lord? You know, like Stephen, those, you know, you're always resisting the Holy Spirit. Do I resist or do I say, yes, Lord, you know, let it be done according to, to your way, eh? to your word, uh, as Mary did. So, I mean, I think the Acts of the Apostles does, does ask that again and again and again and again, right? How are we responding? And, and, and particularly then for disciples, how do we respond to trials and difficulties and sufferings, right? And, and so the one example, I just love that story of Paul, you know, getting stoned. And here he is. They leave him for dead. I mean, he must have been in rough shape. They thought he was dead, you know, and, and, uh, and, and. What happens? The apostles, the, 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 his, his team, they come around him. What's their response? They just start to pray. They pray in faith. How does it say? You know, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and entered the city. <laughs> like it was like, it doesn't have much commentary just to say they got around him and he rose up. Well, they must have come with an incredible amount of faith. You know, God, God, I, 
I personally, I kind of think he probably was dead <laughs> and God raised him up, you know, but that's my own, you know, thinking, but, but, you know, something amazing happened, but they didn't get disheartened when Paul got stoned. They didn't get discouraged. They didn't get defeated, deflated. No, in that very moment, you know, they turned to God in faith and confidence, you know, and the Lord worked a miracle there. Beautiful, beautiful encouragement. And then the other example, I think, you know, here at the end of chapter 13, right, they've been having great success there in Antioch, Pisidia. Many have come to open their hearts to the Lord, and then, the, then there's opposition coming. Again, what happens, right? Persecution gets stirred up against Paul and Barnabas, and they get drove, driven out of their district. Right, and what is what is the response? What's the response? That's in verse number fifty-one, fifty-two of chapter thirteen. They shook the dust off their feet against them and went on to Iconium. It's like okay, when someone opposes the Lord, sometimes we go out and try and share our faith with someone. We try to share the Lord with someone, and they don't want to have anything to do with it. They rebuff us, whatever. You know what did these disciples do? Ah, they shook the dust off their feet. Oh, well, this person just isn't interested in eternal life, right? <laughs> so it, it just didn't bother them a whole lot. And, the, and then the next line, and the disciples were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. Not only do they shake the dust off their feet, they're filled with the joy of the Lord. You know, that's not us. I tell you, most of us, if someone looks funny at us, we're all beat up and deflated and we go about dragging our bottom lip on the ground for three days, you know, and these disciples get, get persecuted, they get thrown out for dead, they get stoned, they get all these things. But it's like, oh no, we got a mission. Jesus has a mission, whatever, dust off the feet, and away we go, right, with joy in their hearts. I mean, we can learn something from these, these apostles and, and, and early Christians. They've got something, you know, that we need today. And I think that's why Acts of the Apostles is resonating in our heart. We need some of that spirit of courage and, and uh, you know, joy in the midst of the trials we face today. We need to get a little stronger, you might say, in our, in our, in our kind of in our spine. We got a little get a little stronger, right? in uh, standing in the Lord and in the mission that Jesus has entrusted to us. He's called us. He's called us. He's chosen us. He's anoint us. He sent us, right? And, and we have a mission to let's not get, let things get in the way of that, and that incredible, you know, calling of Jesus on our life. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. It's so true. The other thing, Father, and I are talking about it in this section is, is the gift that prophecy is to build up the church. So I just want to reflect on that for, for a little bit. Luke begins the chapter 13, the first three verses, and each verse makes a particular point. Right? He's, he, he begins the story of Paul and Barnabas and the first missionary journey by highlighting these three points. In 13 verse 1, it says, in the church in Antioch, the following were apostles and teachers. What Luke is doing is highlighting the important roles that these two charisms of the Holy Spirit play in building up the church. They are key for the establishment of the church. Teaching, right, and prophecy. In verse 2, we see when Paul and Barnabas are set apart for mission, they're responding to a prophetic word spoken by somebody to the community. The point is, the Holy Spirit is directing the church through the prophetic word. And more than that, the community is listening and being obedient to it. And that's the absolute key to su the success of the church's establishment in, in Gentile territory. In Acts 13, uh, sorry, 13.3 then, the third verse, it says that the word came as they were praising God and fasting. Right? This is a constant theme throughout Acts. Whenever the church or its members need the grace to be attentive and obedient to what the Holy Spirit is doing, we see the, the people enter, entering into prayer and praise and fasting. Right? Because you as we die to ourselves, particularly our, our physical selves, then 
our spirits become filled as we praise God, right? So prophecy is, is being able to speak the word of God, right? God expresses his will through an inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And it may, you know, it can be to build up. It can be to encourage. It can, can be to call to repentance or to challenge. It can be to give direction. So in, in Acts, what Luke is, is showing us is that the prophetic word is normative for the church to express this gift and be led by the Lord through this gift so that the Lord's will is clear and can be obeyed, right? And we know that whenever the Lord's word is obeyed, there is blessing for the people. There's, the Lord can bless the situation then. So the two things I want to point out about this is we're seeing in Acts. And the first one is the fulfillment of Joel 3, 1 to 5. Remember, Peter, Peter refers to Joel at, at, during the Pentecost speech he makes. It will come to pass in the last days, this is the Lord who speaks, that I will pour out a portion of my spirit on all flesh. And then he talks about everybody being able to prophesy. So one of the main effects of the coming of the Holy Spirit is that the gift of prophecy is released. It's no longer just for a few anointed individuals with a special mission, like, like Joel or like Samuel or Jeremiah, but it's for all God's people, male, female, young and old, servant and free. And it's critical for the expansion of the church. And that's what Acts is demonstrating. The second thing we, we need to see is that we're, we're beginning to see that the prophets are are acting as a distinct ministry group, right? When when um, Agabus comes from from Jerusalem to to uh, Antioch in Syria, he's coming with a group of prophets to uh, to uh, steady the church, to to root the church deeper, right? So we're we're beginning to see them act together. We see when Paul and Barnabas are set apart for mission too. You you gather the prophets and the teachers together to pray, right? Um, so today in our church, you know, we kind of lost much of that sense of the importance of the prophetic, right? Um, I, I think the church is awakening, awakening to this, both, both at the hierarchical level and at the grassroots level. I think we're awakening to its importance. And Vatican II brought this out, right? Uh, John the 23rd opens it by saying, open Vatican II by saying, breathe into us your Holy Spirit as in a new Pentecost, right? The birth of the charismatic renewal in the church points to this. John Paul II, I think it was in 1987 or 88, he says that the hierarchical and the charismatic dimensions of the church are co-essential co for her health and for her existence. And what we see Pope Francis doing in the formation of charis, if you know anything about that, what he's doing, he's elevating the charismatic dimension of the church. So that there's a better balance between the charismatic and the hierarchical. So that the, lead, the leading of the Holy Spirit happens both ways and is strong both ways. So what does that mean for you and me? And I think what it's saying is we, we've got to take the prophetic word we hear once it's discerned that it's of the Lord, of course. We've got to take it seriously and we've got to begin to obey it so the Lord can bless us like he plans to. I just want to give you an example. I'm chairman for the Catholic Charismatic Renewal Services, right? And uh, beginning of February, I received a word of knowledge from from some from an individual whose prophetic gift has been proven to be authentic. It bears fruit. We see the Lord's blessing as we respond to the prophetic word of this woman. And she wrote me in early February to say that while I was praying the sorrowful mysteries, I saw a hand holding a sieve, and it was shaking was sifting and she said she could see in it a number of uh, stick-like objects and as she leaned in to look closer she said she realized that they were people struggling to stand up as this sifting is happening and she explained that it, that Jesus is warning us that Satan has his sights set on us like he did to the apostles here Paul and Barnabas and Peter she said, God is doing the shaking, but Satan is doing the sifting. At some point in her prayer, she said, as people struggled to get to their feet, another hand appeared and took the sieve, she said. 
and it was the hand of Jesus. And he said to the devil, these are mine. And then she gave me some readings, Luke 22, 31, 32, and John 17, 20, that, that you, can, you can look at if you want to further reflect on this. But the point that, I'm, that I, is, is important right now is, is that we are called to stand firm in the midst of the spiritual battle. And we've got to take Paul and Barnabas as an example of that for us. But as I was praying, because the prophetic word always demands a response, right? The Lord is looking for us to respond in a specific way. We're not just supposed to say, oh, isn't that a wonderful word? Yahoo, oh, it makes me feel great. There's a response demanded. And so I was praying about this. And, and while I was praying, I received another email from another person that doesn't know I received the other email. And it's a delegate from the Ontario um, CCRSO, Charismatic Renewal. And, and she writes me and she says, I really feel this urgent need to invite people to fast and pray for nine consecutive Fridays, beginning February 5th, going to April 2nd. April 2nd happened to be Good Friday. And when I read the email, I thought, oh, this is the response the Lord is calling us Two, this is how he wants us to enter into this spiritual battle. So I contacted the national team. We had a little meeting. We just, we're going to tell everybody in each of our provinces about this prophetic word and invite them to join us to enter into this spiritual battle with prayer and with fasting. So we posted on the Ontario website, for example, that the theme of the specific intention for each Friday as we fasted. And then we put a link to a live stream of perpetual adoration so that people could, as they prayed, um, be in front of the Lord. It, it isn't news to anybody that our world's in crisis and our church is in crisis. And the Lord is guiding us the same way he was guiding the Acts of the Apostles. They were establishing the church. We need to be re-establishing the church. That's what the new evangelization is all about. So the prophetic word is important for the church today as it was in the first century. I'm convinced of it. We really do have to begin to pay more attention to it. Father, do you think we should go on to chapter 15? Well, I, I just want to pick up on uh, sure. first on, on the prophecy thing there, Brian, you know, because I just I happened to throw on a video clip of Father Bob Bedard, the founder of the Command of the Cross, a few days ago. And he cited this passage of, of Acts chapter 13 as a great example of how a prayer meeting works today and the prophetic word comes forth. And he said, basically, oftentimes it's when a group of people get together and they're praying and and maybe praising the Lord, what will happen is God will begin to put a message in someone's heart. It's not necessarily the message, you know, it's audibly heard, you know, in the group. God starts speaking out loud and everybody hears God. No, God puts that message on one person in their heart. And then when that person speaks out the message they feel God's giving to them, the others in the group say, yeah, that sounds right. That's the Lord. And I think that's what happened here. While they were worshiping, while they were worshiping, while they were praising, you might say, and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, well, how did the Holy Spirit say? It said it to one person. The Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Paul or Paul and Barnabas to work to the, for the work that I've called them. Right? And as they spoke that out, there was a sense. Then after praying and fasting, they laid hands on them and sent them off. There was a sense, yeah, that's the word of the Lord. And so when we get the word of the Lord, we generally know it. There's some sense of rightness that's part of the prophetic word. What I love about this passage too is like, I think you touched on it, Brian, is like in the early church, the gift of prophecy was very prevalent. It was like... Here in Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. It was a matter of fact, you'd have prophets and teachers. Nowadays, go into most parishes, and if I was to say in most parishes, well, where are the prophets here? I think most people in the parish would say, what? What are you talking about? I don't know what any of that is, you know? Like, and yet it was, it was normal in the early church for there to be kind of a, almost like a, a group of prophets in, in, in each community. That, their job was to catch the word of the Lord and tune into it. Yeah, I think Brian, you're right on. We got to rediscover it. But God is awakening that today in our in our time and it's exciting to be able to be be a, a part of that. So truly is. 
So any, what were you thinking in terms of going ahead there, Brian? What, what, what? Well, I, we got 10, I've got 10 minutes or eight minutes actually left. It would take us to late 20. I don't know if there's enough time for questions there. So I, we could do either, Father. What oh, do you think? I see what you're saying. How far did we get? We, we got to the end of chapter 14. Okay, we can leave 15 to next week. That's fine. Okay. I don't have too much to say about 15 myself, so whatever. I, it would take me about eight minutes, but it would maybe not allow enough questions. Okay, let's ask a couple questions then. Do we have any questions, uh, Sister Philomena, or did we lose her? Oh, there she is. Yeah, Father, we, we got one as you were talking about prophecy, which was a really beautiful teaching, by the way. Um, someone was asking, Diane was wondering how a prophecy, how prophecy applies to lay people, how that gift maybe is op operating in the church. Well, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, uh, and this is, this is a little bit the challenge that we face, right? To say that, you know, there's sometimes an association with prophecy and the clerical state, right? It's like, uh, the priests have all the gifts, right? That's kind of, in some ways, the thinking that we've we've had in the church, and and um, I mean, maybe in some ways we've thought that, you know. But but I think what we're realizing today, no, those gifts are distributed to everyone, as Saint Paul says, for the building up of the faith or the church or the community, and uh, God distributes them like. You know, and Paul used the analogy of body parts, just like there's many parts to the body, right? Uh, so too the church is made up of many parts and prophecy being one of those parts and, and the Lord distributes the gifts as he wills. We don't know, you know, who's going to get prophecy. I could want to be a prophet, but that I might not have any gift for being a prophet. But the, the person beside me might be very anointed with that gift of prophecy. Where does it come from? It's rooted in our baptism, or you might even say in our confirmation, even more, because our confirmation is really opening up the grace of the Holy Spirit for the mission of the church, and certainly in Lumen Gentium, in the in the in the in the uh, Vatican documents, chapter twelve. You can look at chapter twelve of Lumen Gentium. Just type that in. Beautiful little chapter there, saying that the charisms, the gifts of the Spirit, are to be welcomed right by all the faithful. Whether to be welcomed by all the faithful, um, um, kind of with with I don't I think it's I don't know enthusiasm or gladness whatever. But then it goes on to say, but we're to discern all things every uh, also, right? So we gifts need to be discerned by the community. I can feel that I'm a prophet, but if nobody else thinks I'm a prophet. You know, we, we might want to examine ourselves. Maybe we're just a kind of a, a, a little bit of uh, our own kind of puffed up thinking, right? The church has to discern these gifts as well, right? But, but I think nowadays, I mean, it is a challenge. Does that mean that Sunday during Mass, you're going to get up and speak a prophecy in the middle of Mass? No, I don't think so. I think we have to find ways to open up these gifts of the Holy Spirit for the laity, in other kind of venues, in other kind of situations in the church where people can use them. And that's why the prayer meetings have been so beautiful, you know, on, on, a, on, a, on a, you know, Wednesday, Thursday evening, uh, you know, 20, 30 people get together in the church basement and they start praising the Lord and then the prophecy starts coming forward. You know, and I, I've always been of the conviction that prayer meetings are essentially training ground for mission. That's the purpose of the prayer meeting. It's so that you can go in and learn about your charisms. You go to the prayer, prayer meeting to discover your charisms, to learn about them, so that next week when you're out in some situation, you can start ministering in the power of the Holy Spirit like they did in the Acts of the Apostles. You can minister in the anointing. You can minister in your gifts. But if you don't have anywhere to practice using your gifts, you know, go to the prayer meeting and, and don't be afraid to make a mistake. I often tell people, if you go to the prayer meeting and you get it wrong, it's okay. You know, like the prayer group, you're just not going to have anybody affirm you at the end of the meeting. Nobody's going to come and say, wow, that was a powerful word that touched my heart. 
you know, but if it's from God, it will touch hearts and it will move them. So, so, so we will learn about our gifts and, and discern them in that context so that ultimately we can use them in all sorts of situations every day in our life. I don't think the care, unfortunately, this is the problem in a little bit with the prayer meetings is it was like the prayer meeting became the be all and the end all. And it was like, okay, I go in, I use my gifts and then, okay, have a nice week and I, I just go back to my old life for the next seven days. Well, no, it's the launching pad for the mission. It's the training ground for the mission. I go in there, I get filled up, I get encouraged, but then I go take Jesus out into the world to bring the love of God to others, right? And then and minister in the power of the Holy Spirit. So anyways, that's a long answer maybe for a short question, but, uh, but I, I, what I, else? I, I, yeah, I would just say, Diane, if you if you want to learn more about that, then you should probably be coming to the conference that we're having on boot camp for the laity, where Father Ben and and the Bishop Scott McKay are going to speak about this kind of stuff. And what what is the role of the laity in the church today? What do we expect from the laity? What does the Lord expect from us as laity? And how do we accomplish it? Those are the things that they're going to talk about. So I just invite you to go onto the website ccrso.net and register for that conference. It, it, it's well worth it, I think. And I think if you look at John Paul II, he talked about a new evangelization. He says it's time for a new evangelization. What's unique about the new evangelization? What makes it different than all the other initiatives of evangelization over the years? Well, number one, the new evangelization is going to be led by the laity. It's no longer a clerical movement. It's no longer something primarily that the priests and the religious will be doing. It'll be the lay people that'll be doing. Number two, it's often in Christian, you know, kind of, uh, kind of the remnants of Christian culture. So it's not necessarily to go to Africa or to go to far off lands somewhere in the world. We always used to think of evangelization as taking the gospel to an, a non-Christian country in the world. Well, take a look around you in Canada. There are non-Christians everywhere. You know, the mission field now is in our backyard, right? It's I don't have to leave the country to go and evangelize the world. I can just, you know, look over my fence in the backyard, right? So what's the new evangelization? It's the laity and it's in 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 and it's in it's in mission territories that or it's in it's in it's in our own home, right? To me these are Ralph Martin talks about that as two key elements of what really comprise the new evangelization. And then he also said, you know, John Paul II said new methods and new zeal. New methods and zeal. Well we gotta get creative with evangelizing. On campus, we started giving out free popcorn, you know, at a table in the hallways, and we ended up giving four or 5,000 bags of popcorn out for a week, you know, and telling people about Jesus. Well, that's, that's the new way. I don't think St. Paul had popcorn, nor did he carry a popcorn machine on his, on his travels through, you know, Pamphylia and all of that. No, right? He went, his method was to go into the Jewish temples. Our method at York University is to give popcorn out in the hallways. We got to find new methods and a new zeal, a new excitement for, for all of this. Anyways, okay. So, uh, sister, any other questions? Yeah, there's a couple here. Um, actually, you're just talking about evangelization. We have somebody asking, is there a plan on how to evangelize? Oh, what a question. I don't know that there's a plan, right? No, I think it's, it's like, I think part of it is just, we have to really understand the dynamic of evangelization. We have to understand how evangelization works. It's not like a program that gets implemented. A, a, you know, it's not like the bishop's going to come out with, you know, here's the strategy. Although he can come out with a strategy, at the essence of evangelization is understanding how do we pass on the faith to someone. And the more lay people that understand the dynamic of how that works, how do I share Jesus with, with someone that I meet? You know, when we can discover how that works and how when we get there. Paul and Barnabas this time, he'll lead our small community. There'll be a prophetic word that will direct your activity. It will happen because the Lord wants this more than you and I want it. And not only that, you'll have the other charisms that are needed. You'll have the miracle workers. You'll have the healers. You'll have the teachers. You'll have the preachers. All of that will be in the community. 
And if and if each community can be directed by the Lord to respond to however the Lord wants them to respond, if we're listening to the Spirit, listening to the Lord through the power of the Spirit, He will be able to bless His people, right? There could be a different program for every group led by the Holy Spirit. That's the key. That's the key. We're following the guidance of the Lord like these guys did. Eh? Then we're going to get the blessing. Sister, we got time for one more or we're getting tight? Father, yeah. If we, if we, uh, I think we have time for one more if you'd like to an, uh, answer one more. We have somebody wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on infant baptism. Were you saying that the church like encourages that um, in the story of Cornelius? Well, I mean, right now we take it for granted. Infant baptism is really the norm for most Catholics. You know, there are sometimes adults who become Catholic or become Christian later on in life. But more often than not, myself, I was baptized as an infant. Most of our Catholics, I would argue probably out of the 300 and so amount of people tuning in this evening, probably 95% have been baptized as infants. That's my, so it's become the norm today. And so people, so many of our Protestant brothers and sisters, they say, well, well, that wasn't going on in the early church. So what, what gives, you know, in the early church, it was all adults coming to Jesus, right? And they, when adults came to Jesus, they really knew what they were committing to, potentially dying a martyr, but also that Jesus was asking them to give their life to him. Right? And so adults had a full giving over of their heart, their will in a covenant to God, right? And then they came into the faith, God baptized this kind of thing. The great challenge with infant baptism is I don't make my own choice for Jesus. My parents make the choice for me. I just get brought down as an infant to the water font, font and get dunked in. Right? So it's a choice someone else is making on behalf. And so infant baptism creates a challenge. Right, because I, I don't have an act of the will in there. The the idea of marriage is that, you know, and raising children is that you raise the children in such a way that they are encouraged to make their own choice of faith, to accept the baptism that the parents had given them right off the bat. But a lot of times parents don't understand that that's their job. They don't understand that's their role. You know, nor do, nor do the, you know, schools always, you know, like, I mean, confirmation programs often miss the mark on all of that too. And so what happens, we just got tons of people out there that are baptized as infants, but have never, you know, accepted Jesus into their life, never, never committed themselves to, to, to following the Lord. And so, I mean, I'm all for infant baptism because it expresses just the gratuitous love of God. I don't have to do anything to earn my salvation. I don't have to do anything to earn, you know, this great gift of God. I'm, in fact, I'm probably screaming and crying as I'm getting baptized, you know, with poopy diapers, whatever it is, right? Like I'm not bringing anything to the table except someone's bringing me. What a, what a gratuitous favor of God that, you know, and our Protestant brothers and sisters often talk about, you know, that that it's, we're not to do any works, you know, it's not about works, it's a free gift from God. Well, infant baptism communicates that totally. It's a free gift. That little baby doesn't do anything, you know. But then the challenge is now with infant baptism is to, to help someone once they become older to really accept the gift. All I'm saying is that passage of Cornelius, it was Cornelius and his family. The assumption many make is there were probably children there that got baptized that may not. And so it sets a precedent. So we see even in the early church, the, 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 the uh, you know, an instance where there was probably infant baptism going on, or at least children going on at, at an early, early stage in the life of the, of the church. So we'd have to do a whole study on the history of infant baptism, but, uh, but th there's a little seed of, of that in that passage. Okay. So anyways, hope that helps. That's a few questions. Just to say there was someone else texting me a bunch in the chat room. Yvonne, Stepfolds, I can't answer all your questions. You were texting me directly. I just let, I'll try and get a hold of you later and answer some of those. Otherwise, thank you all for coming out. We're going to sing one more song. 
I don't know. It's always good to praise the Lord. Great things seem to have happened in Acts of the Apostles. So let's let Sister lead us in one more song, and then I'll give you a final blessing and send you on your way. All right, praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We adore you, we love you, we praise you. Come and tune our hearts to sing your praise. Come now, fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy, never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by Thank you, Lord. Come, Lord Jesus, do come into our lives tonight, Jesus, every day as we go forth as well, Lord. Just continue to anoint us, continue to open up your word for us, Lord. Let your word move our hearts. Let it touch us. Let it change us, Lord Jesus. We just seek your blessing in every way, Lord Jesus. Anoint us with your Holy Spirit this week as we go forth, Lord Jesus, to be your disciples on mission, to be your lay apostles, 
Jesus, you have a great call in all of our lives. Open up the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Lord, as St. Paul said, especially that we would prophesy, release gifts for prophecy, release gifts, Lord, for evangelism, for teaching Jesus, for pastoring, for shepherding, for leading your people, for worship, Jesus, for intercession. Lord, release all the gifts of your Holy Spirit in a mighty, mighty rushing wind and way. And we ask this in faith through Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 We could probably pray for half an hour here now, but I'm want, conscious of the time. I just want to send you out. I think, Brian, for homework, I think we have. Do you want to say something before we do homework? Or you? I, I, I do. I do. Just before you, you do that, because this word from Susie, this prophetic word we receive, Father and I are doing a Life in the Spirit seminar uh, every week. And um, there was a prophetic word last week spoken, and I, it's a now word. It's a word for everybody here, I believe, too. So I want to share it with you. My children, go into your room and close the door. Pray for an outpouring of my anointing for this generation, that I may use you in humility to break the bondages. Your children will be restored to health to break the power of the enemy, to see the captives be set free, an anointing to break mindsets, to break additions, to break depression and anxiety, sadness over my children who are suffering. This is what I desire to give you, my children, in times like this fresh anointing. My children, ask for it every day, just like when you need to refuel your car, you are my children, and I desire to fill you up with the spirit of anointing every day. Ask, ask, ask. I am looking for my children who will get the attention of this generation. I need your hands. I need your feet to be a service for the building up of my kingdom. Amen. He wants our yes, and so yes, Lord, we give you our yes, Lord Jesus. Raise up, Lord, a generation of sons and daughters that will serve you with great zeal and faithfulness and use us, Lord. Use your people in mighty ways, Lord Jesus. Use us to establish your kingdom, Jesus. All things are possible, Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. So I think we have for homework chapter, we read up to end of 15. So I think 16 to 21. What do you think there, Brian? Sound right? Sound right. Sound right. Yep. Okay. So you got some work to do, some reading, but that's only like one chapter a day, one chapter a day. So that's not too bad. And then you got a couple of days off as well. So uh, <laughs> any other thoughts? I just say that as I said before, a prophetic word always demands a response. So you've heard this prophetic word spoken to you. He's told you what he wants the response to be in the very first line. Yeah. Those that will take it seriously, those that will obey, will receive the blessing the Lord wants to impart. He says, my children, go to your room, close the door, pray for an outpouring of my anointing on this generation. Okay. That I will use you humbly to break the bondages, etc. Brian, um, someone was asking in the chat if it was possible to have that prophecy in writing. Any thoughts? Sure, uh, Father, you have the connections here. I, I, I could, yeah, I, we can send it to everybody. I don't know how to do that. You would, I guess, Father. Yeah, let me see how I can do that. Okay, so send send it to me, Brian, and then we'll we'll work work on that. Okay, okay. that would be great. If I don't get it to you by email, then I'll uh, I'll I'll uh, I'll uh, we'll post it next week. But um, but uh, certainly, let us respond. Hey, eh? let's commit to responding to that prayer in our rooms for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on this generation. Do you want to advertise the CCRSO uh, conference? Do we have that one, Sister Francis? That uh, little um feel free to go if you need to uh that is the um that's the the the, the boot, boot camp, camp. Or late. The late. what's the date it's the 21st 22nd of may yeah it's coming up 
kind of quickly, uh, please get registered if you'd like to receive the Zoom invite for that. There it is, Boot Camp for Lady, the role of the lady in the church. It's with uh, Bishop Scott McCaig. He's going to give two talks. Father Ben is going to give a talk. The talks will be um, about 50 minutes in length. We're going to see, I'm not sure we're going to be able to do small groups. We want to be able to do that, breakout rooms, but we'll have to see whether it's possible or not. Okay. Okay, but it's at the ccrso.net website. CCRSO, Catholic Charismatic Renewal Services of Ontario.net. And you just have to, where it says click here, you just got to click there and you can register. Okay. Awesome. Okay, we'll see you all later. We'll see you next week.